Good afternoon, viewers. Actually, on behalf of the Department of English, University of Gurugongo, let me welcome you all to this new session as part of the online lecture series that we are organizing. <laughs> well, the Corona pandemic has given us many heartaches, but for once, it has helped us in bringing to you wise thoughts from various sources, both in India and abroad. The response that we have got and we are getting is really nothing short, than, uh, short of miraculous because people have joined our journey, this common pursuit for academic excellence. And as part of that, today we have with us Dr. Dibbaduti Roy from IIM Indoor is going to talk about digital humanities. And today, on behalf of the Department of English, the session will be conducted by my esteemed colleague, Dr. Swamipendra Banerjee. So as the convener of this program, I wish that this particular session also lives up to our expectation and Dr. Roy's expectation as well. So okay. over to you, Swamipendra. Yes. Uh Thank you, uh, Professor Amit Bhattacharya. So uh, I, uh, we have come over to the to another session uh, of our online lecture series, and it's great to uh, have with us today uh, Dr. Dipotuti Roy, who is from IIM uh, Indore, who's from the Department of Communications at uh, Indian Institute of Management at Indore. But of course, uh, he's one of the founding figures of uh, what is referred to now as Dharti, uh, Digital Humanities. Uh, Alliance Research uh, Training and Innovation, I think. Uh, uh, you will correct me, Bibo, if I got it wrong. But uh, it is it is largely personal. I mean, uh, we, we met at this Dhai conference. It was earlier uh, Digital Humanities Alliance of India, uh, where we met it at I am Indoor. Basically, Dibbo was hosting along with Nirmala Menon, of course. Uh, they were hosting us. Uh, it was a wonderful conference. I was always interested in the digital humanities, but didn't really know much about it. And that was a wonderful exchange of ideas. So today, I think uh, Dibbo will talk uh, a lot about what exactly, what, it, what, what we understand, what we mean by digital humanities, how to do digital humanities, and uh, basically working with figures and uh, certain things, uh, but, but thinking, uh, thinking in terms of humanities, which is very important. So that as well, and along with it, of course, he will he will uh, take us uh, towards decolonizing digital humanities and looking at the practice from the perspective of India and South Asia. So uh, that's it, Dibbo. Without further uh, uh, delay, let us move over to the speaker. Welcome, uh, Dr. Dibbo Duthi Roy. Uh, thank you, Professor Banerjee. Thank you, Professor Bhattacharya. Um, I call Professor Banerjee usually. By the way, in Bengali, we address someone with respect. It's Shomi Pendroda. So thank you, Shomi Pendroda and Professor Bhattacharya for inviting me to Gorbong. It's a pleasure. And it's always, um, you know, as uh, Professor Bhattacharya mentioned in the beginning, the Corona pandemic has really created a lot of, lot of trouble. It's led to uneven infrastructures of digitality becoming even more apparent. But it's also given us some opportunities in the, in the moment of crisis. For example, right now in this room, I can see 89 people, you know, joining in to discuss or uh, have a conversation on this topic, which is uh, far more than uh, most conference rooms, as your colleagues and professors in academia will tell you. It's about 10 people on an academic conference in one room in the morning is a rock star status for most people, <laughs> right? Uh, so I can see Professor McLeod also sharing my uh, sharing my sort of uh, statement. Uh, so in a way, I'm just going to sort of quickly give an example, not give an example, but rather sort of summarize what I'm going to do. So today, my uh, presentation, which I'm just sharing the screen, is called The Politics of Reading, Decolonizing Digital Humanities. The reason it's called this is because we understand reading to be one of the most critical aspects of the humanities or doing the humanities. So I'm going to use that as the jumping jumping platform or the springboard to talk about why digital humanities and what it means to question Anglo-American epistemes of digital humanities 
through reading and questioning reading itself right so um, again if you have any questions during during the talk i would uh, for the time being i would ask you to switch off your microphones if you are not asking questions but if you want to please please um, stop me and uh, please interrupt me and interject and i will hopefully have time for question and answers at the end of the session right so i as has been pointed out i'm an assistant professor in the department of communication at the indian institute of management in indore and the co-founder along with many of my colleagues who joined in today of the digital humanities alliance for research and teaching innovations and one of the places where we started having these conversations and while i'm not saying that digital humanities started in india in 2018 it did not at all but what we were able to do and this was almost a leap of faith me and my colleagues from dhai thai what we were initially called decided to take a leap of faith and try to have a national international conversation on digital doing digital humanities in india in 2018 so my colleague dr nirmala menon and i decided to co organize a conference which happened in june 2018 at iim indore in collaboration with iit indore we were absolutely surprised and definitely very pleased to see a beautiful response and there were over 70 responses to our call for papers and the diversity of dh in india was was put forward to us we had participation from 15 states and five countries and um, which then led us to believe that dh must be done in a more collective while we were a collective already an alliance we started to believe that we needed to do something together and a uh, interim committee was formed at that conference and we then in the last couple of years we have renamed ourselves to 30 digital humanities alliance for research and teaching innovations and i believe this name gives us a little larger ambit and gives us a opportunity to create global conversations and last year once after 30 was formed actually this year in january one of my colleagues who is here i believe dr arjun ghosh um led this initiative to organize a conference on twitter It was India's first Twitter conference, actually, and that also we got a massive response from across the world. We we're very fortunate, which then again solidified the need to talk about this on a much more. Um, while we believe the age in this country is rhizomatic, and this is something I'm going to talk about, but it made us believe that we need to have these conversations. I'm deeply delighted to be able to speak to Gaur Bongo. and uh, dr banerjee has been reaching out to me for a while apologize i couldn't get to this earlier so i'm expecting a lot of conversation a lot of questions and without further ado i'm going to give you a brief introduction to my kind of work with dh recently so the first thing most recent which happened just a week ago was that um, i was chair i chaired a panel on towards an indian decolonial post colonial dh at the dh 2020 conference which is the annual conference of the alliance of digital humanities organizations and uh, we had a wonderful panel this is this was live on youtube and it's also and also available on youtube under the 30 channel so please go ahead i would ask you and, and i'll request you to go ahead and have a look at it to understand the gamut of work that's been done under the umbrella of dh in this country um i was also very fortunate to be one of the fellows for the national endowment for humanities in digital humanities this year uh, at the Central university of central florida this was also virtual and last year i was very fortunate because i feel dh has a very pedagogical angle built in um, and i come from dh also from a media studies perspective so i was at uh, the mit's meet at massachusetts institute of technology mit last year at the uh, media and transition conference where i spoke about integrating caste democracy and digitality so this has been my sort of current work and i'm happy to come back to this i'm not going to talk a lot about my work today because there's always a time and space for that today is not that time today is the time to talk about our collective journey and digital humanities as a whole so to start off today by sort of outlining the agenda for today's talk we'll talk about the politics of reading i'm going to define the humanities because you know that's an easy job people have been trying to do that for the last 1000 years but you know i'm going to do it in 5 minutes i don't claim to be uh, i don't claim to be that arrogant or I, i'm not that stupid either what i'm trying to do is trying to define the digital humanities 
within the ambit of the humanities and what I see it as a self-reflexive enterprise. So I'm going to talk about what is are the digital humanities, who is a digital humanist, that's a very important question. The Indian post-colonial context, contest for DH, and this is a funny story, I originally wrote context, but due to uh, a spelling error it became contest, and then I kept it because I believe there's a lot of contest about who represents DH. No one represents DH is the answer. DH must be de-territorialized, and that's something that me and my colleagues at Dharti, and we are a almost 200 strong community on her, on a whatsapp group right now we have a slack channel we have a website so most of my colleagues who are joining many of my colleagues who are joining in here are from there so they will also be able to join in it's no one's territory we need to de-territorialize dh it cannot be the site of privileged institutions or spaces right so that's a conversation we want to have and finally there are many challenges but there's also opportunities about dh in india and moving forward I'll be focusing largely on India with some references to South Asian DH, but I would like to focus on Indian DH largely because South Asian DH is a different signified and that signified is something that we can debate and talk about. Right. So up front, in front of you, there are three images and here I'm going to ask the audience to interact with me. There's the sixth pillar edicts of Ashoka from 238 BC in Brahmi. There's a Jefferson revolving stand, book stand that, uh, you know, Apocryphally, Thomas Jefferson used to read books on, and there's an Amazon Kindle, right? I'm going to ask the uh, members who joined us today, what do you think is common to all three? I'm going to take like a 30 second uh, interval for that question. Anyone is welcome to respond. Amazon Please. Kindle. Yeah, so there are three things here. There's something that is a com that's common between all of them, right? I can see, I think, some answers in the chat box. So maybe I'll quickly go back to that and have a quick look. Please repeat the question. The question, Dr. Panda, is out of the three things that were on your screen, which is a sixth pillar edicts of Ashoka, a Jefferson revolving book stand, and Amazon Kindle, there is something common to them. So as I uh, minimize my screen. I saw the sort of uh, my next slide reflecting. So I'm going to actually move on to that. All of them are materialities that enable reading. They are not. They are not the reading. Reading the the text itself, but materialities that enable reading. And why is that important? Because without those materialities that enable reading, reading does not exist. And that's fundamentally important because we consider reading as so important to the humanities. But in some respect, this aspect that materialities enable reading as also writing. For example, uh, you know, Murjo Patros or palm leaves on which writing was done in India. The scripts that were created on Murjo Patros are much more circular, like Malayalam, Tamil. The reason is very simple. You couldn't write conical, conical scripts on palm leaves because the leaves would tear. Similarly, like the materialities of writing that create scripts, the materialities of reading will tell us how to read in different points of time in history. So that's something I would like to put a pin on and come back to later on. But one of the problems or one of the issues why in lots of spaces people don't automatically recognize that materialities enable us to read is because we are we are bound within a normative print culture, which obviously starts in 1440 or 15th century when Gutenberg comes to us with the printing press. And largely, humanities and its Anglo American epistemes and even its colonial epistemes looks at humanities as a fundamentally print based episteme. And that's, 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 a, pro that's a problem, right? Because print born assumptions that are born out of the printing press, they linger and are ent entwined with social, political, economic, and especially academic structures in the humanities. Many of you must have read Benedict Anderson's Imagine Communities, where he talks of print capitalism, how print allowed capitalism to thrive. And that's very important to understand. Print is an epistemic shift. Print is an epistemic shift. And it's a fundamentally important shift in the humanities because it allows books to be produced. And that creates structures for many of the way, many of the departments, many of the institutions that have been formed which is why we take print as normative. However, we don't even read 
print the same way. Right? For example, if you are reading uh, a Harry Potter book, or maybe right now a coronavirus pandemic booklet of regulations, you will read from cover to cover. But for example, if you read a conference abstract book, you will only read excerpts or selections that you are particularly interested in. At a magazine stand, you will be grazing or browsing through books or magazines to find out which one you are particularly interested in. And there's obviously skimming or scanning when you are looking at maybe academic literature, right? You skim the first part, you introduction, parts of the body go to the conclusion. And then there's speed reading, which we have to do before an exam sometimes. And fundamentally, there's also reference or lookup. When you go to a library catalog, you look up references, right? So even within reading, reading is defined in many different ways. We all don't read similarly, okay? So one, one major thing that I would like to absolutely emphasize is that the discipline of humanities is not the history of only close reading, the book or print culture, right? This is, this is something very important, that the discipline of humanities is not only the history of close reading the book or print culture. And in the next slide, I'm going to quickly um, give an example of that. Right? So reading in the humanities, right? What does the humanities do? The humanities are disciplines that understand and define cultures and human experience, including history, anthropology, literature, art history, ethics, philosophy, and jurisprudence. Now, one of the issues, not the issues, but one of the fundamental traits of literary studies is that printed books are both our primary text as well as secondary medium of communication. As opposed to say something like history, where they might be looking at non-textual artifacts and then communicating through text or written text. But in literature, we often only focus on textual printed material, which leads us again back to that paradigm of print normativity, right? But what are the humanities supposed to do? What is then is developed through the humanities, right? Humanities is the process of people collectively using identical assumptions and interpreting each other's conversations. And that is known as cultural logic, right? So the humanities enables us to create not only cultural logic and a scholar I quoted in the previous slide, Matthew Kirschenbaum, also says humanities creates cultures of conversation. That's fundamentally what is created in the humanities, right? So cultural logic. Now, one question that often comes to us in the humanities is, what is your methodology, right? This is a question that, I, that comes to me because I teach in what is understood as a non-humanities institution. It's a management school. And many of my colleagues at 30 and across India who are part of the DH Collective, they all teach at technical, technical or management institutions, which are not largely university or liberal arts institutions. So often they're asked, what is your methodology? Now people forget that close reading is a methodology. And here I quote from the Indiana Humanities Council, that read a novel, read a poem, read the directions on a shampoo bottle, read the Declaration of Independence, read a blog, read an essay, read a review of a book you will never read, read a sacred text. Read your diary, read to a kid, read the lyrics to a song you love, read a libretto. So close reading or reading is a methodology itself. And close reading is definitely a methodology. But often in humanities, that is the only methodology that we have been following. Hence, we take that question to be an uh, implied question. Of course, I was close reading, right? Often we don't explain that. As opposed to the social sciences where you explain that, well, I was coding, right? And I was using uh, maybe a participatory action research model. So these are questions that often don't come to the humanities because close reading is the only methodology we've been following. However, is that true? Is close reading the only methodology we've been following in the humanities? Let's see. Okay, so I have on your screen right now, I have what is understood as stylometry and stylometry is basically trying to understand through a re distant reading how the word composition of a particular author looks like. So I'm going to read out this excerpt for you. By the use of the spectroscope, a beam of non-homogeneous light is analyzed and its components assorted according to their wavelength. In a manner very similar, it is proposed to analyze a composition by forming what may be called a word spectrum or characteristic curve, which shall be a graphic representation of an arrangement of words according to their length and to the relative frequency of their arguments. Right. Again, I'm going to share my... Uh, the screen and it's shared right now hopefully with all of you all of you can see this my question to you right now and i'm going to expect a response is when do you think 
this kind of distant reading was taking place give me a time frame anyone no right or wrong answers or there is but we'll pretend that there's none anyone okay just give me a ballpark figure uh 2010 1990s 80s 70s 1980s 1970s what do you think anyone we should yeah, yeah. responses are coming in the chat oh, uh, okay uh, professor banerjee uh, if you could yeah. just read it out to me because my screen is 19, on the 1990s uh, somebody say 1970s uh there is also a 1950s okay okay wonderful uh, professor banerji i would all thank you for doing this i would also request whenever i ask questions if the responses come in the chat if you could read them out to me that would be very kind yes, sure sure thank you so much well so 1950s is the earliest i have got well so, uh, just a minute dr prakash chandra panda says early 1900 the closest dr panda is closest this is 1887 This is the characteristic curves of composition from the magazine Science, which was done by T. C. Mendelhall. So, which tells us that quantitative integration of literature is a story that stretches back through book history, sociology, and linguistics to a range of 19th century experiments. It was only in the 20th century that literary humanistic scholarship began to restrict itself paradigmatically to the close reading of single texts. And this is Ted Underwood, who, as many of you know, is a well-known digital humanities scholar. so this is something that i want to emphasize again up front that this version that quantitative interpretation of literature is absolutely new this is absolutely a uh, path breaking is not not true the idea that we only need to close read single text to do humanistic scholarship is a very recent 19th century experiment and often has a very strong colonial legacy and i'm happy to talk about that more towards the end of the presentation because we don't have time to cover all of that in the beginning again this is very important because why why are we saying that because as you saw you know thomas jefferson was also doing a sort of distant reading with his with his revolving book stand reading multiple books at once and why is that because books are random access devices par excellence and the strict linear sequence of reading we associate with sitting under the tree is the exception not the rule there's nothing wrong If you have a beautiful, beautiful uh, campus, you should go under a, sit, a tree and sit down and read. But that's not the only way of reading. Read, re reading can happen in many different ways. And I'm sorry, is there? Uh, Vivek, can you just mute someone who's? Uh, I think, uh, yeah, for her, yeah. The, the okay. is, please continue. Right. Right. Sure. okay which takes us to what is understood to be uh, the beginning of distant reading in the current current epoch this is franco moretti's famous essay network theory and plot analysis which comes out in the new left review in 2011 where moretti comes and says um, i was trying to analyze the death of gonzago in the in hamlet and i tried to do a network analysis right and what did he do he basically made all the characters in hamlet nodes or vertices and this is what you do in plot plot uh, network theory he made them vertices and the connections between them which are known as edges he tried to visualize how did the murder of gonzago take place by visualizing the conversations and he realized that the murder of gonzago had these these characters which came out as the key characters which was also supported by close reading but the only difference was he never read the text He, what he did was he used the computational method to really just analyze the text from a distance and then come to a visualization like this which takes us to this question and many of you might ask right but you know books are quite we don't have a huge corpus of shakespeare's works it's quite possible for a scholar as it happens in humanities that he or she might spend a lot of time in close reading and uh, analyzing books they are not infinite and that's absolutely true i acknowledge that point the number of books in the world is not infinite there are 50 to 60 million books in the world library of congress holds 32 million volumes british library 25 million national library of china 10 million 
why we may debate whether or not books will be replaced by the digital surrogates we must also accept that books are books also exist in digital form right now and they will have that impact on humanistic studies for the simple reason that born digital is also becoming very 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 important and very common now so as such collections become available we develop the tools with which to read or not read them or distant read them right and one very very important point that i want to make here this is here that distant reading is not to use the machine to supplant the judgment and expertise of human expert who has spent a lifetime reading dickinson for all you know but rather to see if the machine classifications can provoke new insight amongst a body of familiar texts and this is where again a very important emphasis comes in so basically as you can see your research question is fundamental your research question is fundamental your research question decides whether you are doing close reading or you are doing distant reading i am not a techno positivist i do not believe that all technology is meant for good all i believe is that some research questions require close reading and some research questions require distant reading and some research questions might require a combination of both but we as humanists shouldn't close ourselves to the possibility of exploring new knowledge systems just because we are invested in only one form of methodology which is closed reading this takes me to the second way if there are 25 million books how many websites do you think there are at least in 2019 there were 1.72 billion websites and if anyone comes to and comes and tells me well websites are not information the way books are well i would hotly contest that right so for example if there are 1.72 billion websites that's an immediate understanding that knowledge does not only exist in books as the corona virus pandemic has sadly taught us much of our learning is happening online while i'm not claiming digital pedagogy is what we are doing right now it is not because just transferring the normative sense of the physical classroom into an online space is not digital pedagogy i i have strong reservations against that digital pedagogy needs to be a combination of synchronous and asynchronous and we are on our way to that we have not reached there right so i'll come back to that later if you have questions but the point i'm simply trying to make is that there are 1.72 billion artifacts in the world unique artifacts right now where knowledge exists which is not print right so by just looking at this number you can easily understand that this entire ecosystem of knowledge that is not in print and as humanists can we be so arrogant to say well i am not going to look at that because you know i just do print close reading of print books so then do i mean then this is the breadth of traditional humanistic knowledge of close reading no but we need to deconstruct assumptions born out of the print paradigm that knowledge networks and media do not begin or end with the printing press fundamentally this is one if you take away one thing from my session today my presentation today is that we need to deconstruct that knowledge is only born in print and knowledge networks only exist in print no and as humanists if you are dealing with knowledge networks that are produced by humans and are interacted by with by humans we need to consider other models of reading which is why i started with that politics of reading okay so now i'm going to having tried to define humanities i'm not going to try and talk about digital humanities as a whole so digital humanities is humanities in and for a digital age this is one of the uh, definitions and there's many there's an entire ecology of definitional debates as you might know uh, from the university of minnesota press uh, which comes out the debates in dh series um, i'm fortunate to have with my colleague nirmala an essay coming out in the newest debates in dh pedagogy series so um jurgen not says from gottingen that dh is the place where various disciplines meet especially informatics and humanities there are numerous problems that can be solved only solved is if those expertises are brought together and i don't know if i'm able to uh, i have i have a linked video here i hope that's visible to everyone um Pro professor banerji just let me know if the sound or audio or the video is not visible yes yeah the, it is visible i uh, the sound is not yet coming is the sound audible now 
Uh, I'll just pause no. the video. No, not really. Okay. Um, so I think the captions are fine for the time being. But if I can get the sound to play, I'll do that as well. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, apologies for uh, not being able to share audio with you, but I hope that uh, video was more or less uh, self-explanatory and all of you were able to see the transcription of the closed captions. So Adam's work is a wonderful example. He's a very, very typical literary scholar or uh, comes from the literary studies department at King's College London. And as I was trying to tell you, Adam's project is a wonderful example of how research questions predicate what methods you're going to use. So for Adam and his project, the question of trying to understand the Irish experience through literature meant that he had to do a different form of reading. And one of those very important things that comes forward, for example, he says that you know, Irish people were four times more likely to appear in court than an English commoner, is a wonderful example of how literature gives us insights. And this insight was available because he used distant reading, because it allowed him to look at a wide corpus and why such a text, a one a reading from one text, we could have made a similar assessment. It would have been difficult to justify because someone would have come and told us, well, that's just one text. But what uh, Adam's, Adam's reading does is looks through multiple texts. So again, coming back to that key point, what does DH allow us to do? DH allows us to use computer science, informatics, and create questions which which can be answered through computational methods. And DH then becomes a discipline where various disciplines meet, right? The one DH discipline uh, definition that I am particularly fond of is the, from Elijah Meeks at Stanford, who was at Stanford when he wrote this, but I don't think he's at Stanford anymore. So Elijah Meeks said that DH is bringing digital tools, objects, and techniques to bear on traditional humanities scholarship. And this is a particular definition that I personally operationalize when I talk about DH, especially who's a digital humanist. So I would like you to look at this definition. And what it tells us is basically, if you look at this uh, image from Jeffrey Rockwell, which I hope is on your screen right now, it looks at all of those disciplines which were con considered traditional humanities. And it tells us the intersections that can happen with computing. And obviously in the middle are in disciplines that exist at the crossroads. For example, intellectual cyber property or cyber politics exists at the crossroad of political science and computing. Philosophy and history of science and technology would be history and computing. Bibliography and textual studies, you know, Jerome McGann's work, as many of you are aware, already had elements of DH. And many of the scholars of DH who worked with DH in Anglo America, in fact, had been scholars of book history. For example, one of my colleagues, Dr. Padmini Ray Murray, 
who um, was at Srishti uh, earlier and now is an independent scholar as running a design collective. She was in fact a book history scholar and I believe. And for example, in media studies where I come from, which allows you to look at literary theory, culture studies and game studies, all of that and those computational methods that intersect here, right? So new media and these are all within the ambit of computing. So logic, AI, NLP, instructional tech, new media imaging, HCI, hypertext. So again, all I'm trying to show is that there is a convergence. There's a convergence that's happening. And then can we then, how do we define digital humanities when we have this convergence? Is it tools? Is it steps? Is it methods? What is it? Well, to answer you, digital humanities is a collective singular. And I'm using Jeffrey Schnapp and Pressner's, Schnapp and Pressner's term that they talk about in Digital Humanities Manifesto 2.0 which signifies a wide array of convergent practices. It is not one single thing, which is why, it, which if you can uh, remember that uh, essay by Homi Bhabha, um, uh, which where he talks of the English book, right? Science taken for wonders. He talks of the English book as a fluid signifier, a fluid signifier where, which can be used by the English to dominate, which is the Bible in that case, which could be used by the English to dominate the uh, colonized populations. But then again, the colonized populations co-opted that book into their own lexicon. And then that became their tool of resisting the colonizers. So I believe the age could be that tool, could be that fluid signifier. And right now it has a lot of problems because DH has the epistings of colonization of Anglo-America inbuilt into it. So how do we then decolonize this DH? But before we need to understand decolonization, we need to understand that there are basically two waves of digital humanities in the Anglo-American world. The first quantitative wave of the age is digitization projects and creating the infrastructure, database search and retrieval and text analysis. The first act of the age is supposedly uh, when a priest, Father Robert Busa, worked with IBM to digitize St. Thomas of Aquinas' works. And that's considered one of the first, I would say, and that's in most literature that is considered the first example of digital humanities of course it was not known as digital humanities then it was called humanities computing digital humanities is a far more recent term in 2010 uh, william panapaker at mla in fact was talked of digital humanities as, as a term so that umbrella term is a far newer term the second way of qualitative dh research is much more interpretive it looks at interpretive research methodologies for digitized and born digital materials and these would become clear later on in a couple of slides later when I talk about who is a digital humanist, because the obvious question comes, well, if DH is all of this, then how do we do digital human humanities? How do we identify as digital humanists? Right? That's the key question. So there are interpretive research methodologies for digitized and born digital materials. There's digital toolkits, the new disciplinary paradigms, and this new disciplinary paradigms you can see is linked because I wanted to show you this example of electronic literature. I was very fortunate during my PhD to work in a lab that was one of the first proto-DH labs in the US. It was called the Center for Literary Computing at West, West Virginia. And I was the associate editor of this journal called Electronic Book Review, which is an entirely born digital journal. And I got to know about electronic literature, which is basically born digital literature. And uh, to understand electronic literature, I'm happy to talk about this in more detail later on. Very importantly, ELO's electronic literature uh, you know, it, it has a lot of interesting work is being done in India. Today afternoon, one of my colleagues, Dr. Nirmala Menon, had her student, uh, Shanmuga, who defended her PhD works on electronic literature. There's fantastic work happening on e in India. Professor Shobhik Mukherjee from Presidency University also works on electronic literature. So there's lots of people interested in electronic literature, and that's also an example of what kind of work digital humanities produces, creates, and disseminates. Now, now we come to this very important point. Who's a digital humanist? Because what we realized during this uh, high conference in 2018 is that many of us had taken that leap to call ourselves digital humanists. But many of us were quite unsure. Do we call ourselves a digital humanist? So what I understand, if I take Elijah Meeks' definition of digital tools, techniques, and objects, I can think of three models of being a digital humanist. First is the computational humanist, for whom computation technology has become the very condition of possibility required in order to think about many of the questions raised in humanities today. So this is the person who works with digital techniques, 
So for example, if you're using topic modeling, if you're using any statistical technique to read large corpus of text, then you are a computational humanist who's also a digital humanist. But what about a video game scholar? Is a video game scholar is not using any computational method? The video game scholar is essentially a media, media studies scholar who's now looking at a new, new platform and a new ecology, who now explores new forms of literacy that include authoring and analyzing visual, oral, dynamic, and interactive media in a more immersive and sensory rich space. So of course, a video game studies scholar looks at digital objects. So a multimodal cultural scholar is also a digital device. And the last, but definitely not the least, is the person who works with digital tech tools, right? So techniques is computational humanist. We've done objects with multimodal cultural scholar, and then we come to the tools, right? So the person using tools would be a digital archivist who purposefully selects, and I want to emphasize on that word, who purposefully selects online groupings of digital copies of non-digital original materials. So non-digital original materials is very important. Locate in different physical repositories or collections in order to support a scholarly goal. This is very key. So all these three people, and I'm not saying it's limited to these three, but if we operationalize, which I do as a DH scholar myself, Elijah makes his version of DH, which says tools, techniques, and objects. These three people or these three models of scholarship are definitely under the large umbrella or Stephen Ramsey says the big tent, right? The big tent of DH, which doesn't exclude people. They are definitely under this model. Okay. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about computational because that's a question. And in a longer chat, I would be happy to do maybe a, a workshop and 30s planning workshops for a large constituency of people where we can play with these tools. So there are many, many tools for the humanistic scholar or for humanistic data research, right? Humanistic data research. But some of the tools that I personally use is what I'm going to share with you in this particular slide. So social media becomes a great space for trying to understand if humanity creates cultures of conversation. One of the main spaces to understand cultures of conversation is social media. For example, Twitter. So one of the great tools to understand Twitter is TW Explorer. It's from the North, uh, Night Lab, which is at Northwestern University. And it's a wonderful tool for anybody. And most of these tools I'm going to tell you today, except Orange, are all WYSIWYG tools. So WYSIWYG is what you see is what you get. So these are all GUI-based tools, graphical user interface. You don't have to do any command line coding. So unlike something like uh, you know Jupyter Notebook, which is in Python, which I have only learned very recently, though. Um, so Jupyter Notebook, for example, is command line uh, common, uh, command line coding using using Python as an environment. But that that is a character user interface. These are all graphical user interfaces. So TW Explorer allows you TW Explorer and tags, which is Twitter archiving Google Sheet, which is made by Hopsci, are two interfaces. For example, if you want a limited hashtag or three or four hashtags to analyze and you're looking for topical data. So for example, if you're wanting to look at how for the last 10 days, uh, corona, hashtag Corona updates in India has been uh, exhibiting, uh, you know, cultures of conversation amongst different Twitterati. You can do that, right? So TW Explorer is very useful. It also shows you the first 500 tweets, I believe. Tags takes it one level more than that. Tags allows you to look at the first uh, 10,000 tweets with one hashtag for the last seven or 10 days. I think it's either seven or 10 days. But if you need to do historical Twitter archiving, there are other ways, but they might involve a little more labor. They might involve you to understand a little bit of Python. There's also this website called NetWiz, which is for scraping Facebook posts as well as YouTube comments. So I'm happy to share the links later on. I don't have the time or scope today to share specifically how these, uh, how these work. There's also multiple GIS tools, like mapping tools, you know, uh, story map GIS and Palladio. So there are many, many, many other tools. I'm just showing tools that I personally use. I use Voyant a lot. Voyant is a text analysis software that, that was used by Jeffrey Rockwell and Stephen Sinclair. And Voyant is absolutely, absolutely intuitive. Please go to Voyant today, right? Just check it out, voyanttools.org, and just have a look at it. You can just paste a text, you can upload PDFs, and it will offer you wonderful insights into the corpus. And the one that I've started using quite recently is Orange. And uh, Orange is an open source data mining, data mining software. 
you can download it and it allows the kind of coding that you would do on a command level through a GUI interface. So graphic, graphical user interface. I would strongly recommend you can you, you download Orange, lovely tutorials online, and all of the things I'm showing you on my stream today are all open source, which is also a very important consideration for the decolonizing digital humanities. If we don't have open source tools and software, it's very difficult for people from the global south like us to work on DH. And one of the first things we have to do, and I always speak to my computer scientist friends, is about creating open source tools for humanistic research. Right? So in the middle, I've put DIRT. DIRT's a website for, it's a compendium of digital research tools. So you're welcome to look up DIRT, which offers you many, many options. So multiple, it's a compendium. It's sort of the primer to understand what tools you'd like to use for audio analysis, for video analysis, image analysis, many different tools. Right. So now I come towards, I'm coming to the end of my uh, presentation, right? So as we near close to six, I come now to the Indian context for DH, right? It's important to understand what does the Indian Indian context for DH look like, right? The Indian context for DH is, is absolutely brilliant. I just have a few uh, examples on my screen right now, but I'm going to talk a little bit about some of them. For example, on the top left-hand corner, there's Project Madurai. Project Madurai was about digitizing ancient Tamil texts into Unicode and putting it on the net. And it's a project that has been there for a long period of time. There's one project which many of you are aware of, which came from Jadupur University and one of the pioneering projects of DH in this country. It's called Bichitra, which was an online variorum of Tagore's works, produced, I think, on the 150th anniversary of uh, Tagore. And these two are um, examples. And why I start with these two examples is because they represent two different spectrums of Indian DH. Right? Project Madurai was created by a loose group of independent scholars who came across and started working on saying that you know Tamil, Tamil texts, ancient Tamil texts should be digitized. On the other hand, Vichitra was a far more institutional and, if I might say, privileged enterprise because like my institution, like IIM, it's a privileged institution. Dadapur is also privileged to have a wonderful powerhouse of scholars across areas. So computer science and literary studies came together to create this beautiful barrier, right? So this, this shows up front the absolute spectrum of the age work in this country. There's also the Shod Ganga, which is a reservoir of Indian thesis which is something that's very important in the overall landscape of um, Indian DH work, the Ullur Digital Archives data, which is exported to the Digital Archive of Tamil Agrarian History. Then there's the National Digital Library of India, which talks about multiple regional language. There's uh, Swatantra Malayalam Computing, which is working on a free software collective, engaged in development, localization, and standardization. And there's multiple examples. This is only the examples I could put on this slide. Now, one thing I think you are getting where, where I'm getting at. So digital humanities is not confined to print. It is also not confined to one language. This is something that me and my colleagues at 30 are fighting for. We are fighting for the regional, multilingual. So Bangla, Tamil, Marathi, Punjabi, all of these have a stake in digital humanities. That's something we are fighting for. And I'm going to, I've shared here uh, the, the open access printing platform that my colleague Nimbala Menon has started at IIT Indore, which is SHIP, uh, Knowledge Sharing in Publishing. So I you know, feel happy to reach out to me or Nimbala to talk more about this. It's a wonderful initiative about creating open access platforms. There's also a lot of interesting work happening at many other places across the country, right? This is, again, this is only representative because I want to tell you Again, that DH is rhizomatic in this country. DH doesn't have, if you read Deleuze and Guattari, which I'm sure uh, some of you as literary scholars and human scholars would have read, DH doesn't have a tap root or a secondary root. DH is like ginger. DH is adar matum. I mean, Bangla, I'm getting to Bangla here because see, I'm talking of regional language and I don't acknowledge the fact that I am a Bengali, not to sort of justify or hierarchize language. But to acknowledge the fact that Bangla, Bangla hai kotha bola, Hindi te kotha bola, Hindi mein baat ki jiye, Bangla mein baat ki jiye. The fact that DH can exist in multiple languages and it must exist in multiple languages. That's one key facet, right? We must acknowledge the regional multilingual aspects of DH that must come to the fore. 
right however there are major challenges right and this is one of the subtitles of the conference that was held in i am indore in 2018 which was dh in india contestations connections and collaborations so the subtitle for our uh, conference was contestations connections and collaborations we started out with the idea that dh in india contests anglo american epistemes and we operationalized timothy brennan's famous essay where he says the digital humanities bust and there's this very interesting war happening called the digital humanities war on the chronicle of higher education which you are welcome to look at which has different people ted underwood professor daza writing to each other so we realize that dh in india is contesting existing structures of anglo american dh and there's this wonderful scholarship that exists from uh, the center for internet and society which is also one of our collaborators in this enterprise of india dh and pt sneha sneha was a very good friend was one of our keynote speakers at the first conference uh, sneha has the first seminal work in mapping indian dh and it's called mapping indian digital humanities digital humanities in india so i would it's an open source text you can just go on to the website of cis and get that get that text so we were contesting but we are also looking at the connections we found out there were connections that existed amongst what we understood as you know technical institution management institutions but there were conversations among scholars which led us to the importance of collaborations right so that's why these were the three themes however we also realized and acknowledged that there are certain very key problems which is that for example good ocr software that can produce digitized indic text with high levels of accuracy still elusive for example uh, to digitize bangla or to digitize uh, hindi and these are still the normative languages in this country even for digitizing these texts there is very little good ocr I'm not saying does it exist it exists but with high levels of accuracy is still quite elusive also some of the electronic literature and we are as i said getting into an ecology of electronic literature that should be born digital are in most cases remediations the digital versions of text that would have existed in any earlier media so these are not really electronic literature so that's one issue also dh has only recently started to consider the intersectional implications of technology race gender sexuality and interrogating the often excuse me masculinist ideologies of techno positivism right so technology is um, a very gendered tool not because technology by itself is male or female but because people in power which are mostly males um, in a patriarchal setup they you end up using technology so technology has a very gendered signified and my phd was about uh, communication in the nuclear industrial complex and i love quoting from this uh, quote by uh, and the nuclear bomb in fact so there is quote by a scholar called alex wellerstein he said that the politics of the nuclear bomb was not in its wiring diagram right so the politics of any technology is not in its wiring diagram the politics of technology comes much later but we must acknowledge that politics unless we acknowledge that politics and this is where the humanists come into play as humanists we have been engaging in conversations or cultures of conversation and we understand these politics which are very important we have looked at them in text now we can look at them in technologies and the platforms very important right and lastly um, and this is only some of the problems but this is something very important india's pernicious colonial history and this actually links to the next slide that i'm going to talk about india's pernicious colonial history that saw the do it for me attitude of british colonial imperialists has now percolated into our caste system right it's further complicated by india's caste politics where upper class hindu men to which also i belong upper class and upper caste and women in some cases they're obverse to the ideals of building and making right so many humanist scholars i have heard and with no Uh, aspersions or disregard to anyone they have said that right, this is not my job this is the work of coders and i felt that was a very odd comment to make right uh, why can't coders and uh, literary scholars exist on the same plane and have a wonderful conversation i know they can i'm sure many of you do but that's an in social imaginary that many of us often think that the humanities belongs to so in fact uh, a funny story since i teach in a management school i'll give you a corporate example of india's do it for me culture um ikea that swedish furniture company uh, which is very famous for sending the particular objects to the you know just the this, this uh, you know you assemble the furniture they send you all the raw material and you assemble the furniture back in your home 
IKEA when they launched in India, they, this is the only country where they had to tie up with a furniture company to make. So they tied up with Pepper Fry because no one was willing to make the furniture back home. So we have a fundamental problem with making, and this is one of the fundamental debates in the humanities, right? The making versus doing, or the hack versus yak, right? So who's a digital humanist? Someone who codes or someone who talks about the issues and the politics, right? Now, what does so? These are some key provocations, and I'm coming to the end of my presentation. I'm not going to give you answers, but I'm going to end with some key provocations. That some of the provocations are: what is the humanities after it has been digitalized, or what is the digital after it has been humanized? What kinds of institutions, infrastructures, and interstices are required to promote decolonial or postcolonial digital humanities? How important is it for Indian humanities? And this is very important. This is very important, right? Um, so Melissa Terrace, a scholar, wrote in 2011 about this metaphor of the big tent under which digital humanities exists. But our question and my question especially is: uh, there are some people who know what the digital tent is, what the big tent of digital humanities is. But what about those people who don't? Will they not be called digital humanists, or will they not be taken under the consideration of digital humanities? So how important is it for Indian humanities researchers, pedagogues, and practitioners? to identify as digital humanists to participate and contribute in the global project of digital humanities and lastly or can indian digital humanities with its specificities and limitations such as the technological divide lack of a linguistic unifier and unequal technological structures educational structures develop a new theory and a decolonized praxis for global dh right and of course the corona virus pandemic has given us examples of what unequal educational structures are we are all very aware of that so we must acknowledge it but before the acknowledgement we must also say that what does technology look like in india for that i am going to use a metaphor right so that metaphor is in 1999 dr shugato mitra did something called the hole in the wall experiment hole in the wall experiment was a simple experiment where uh, in a literally uh, in a hole in a wall in kalkaji the slum area of kalkaji in delhi he established or he put in a computer with all of its peripherals and software programs built in and uh, when the when people around said what do we do with this he said nothing he walked away and 7 days later when uh, he came back the assumption was that the computer must have been broken out of the wall and taken away instead he saw people and kids playing especially young kids playing there right and when uh, when he went into that space he realized one very important thing that not only were the kids making things on the computer they were also not using the vocabulary of computing that is considered generally normative a quote here interestingly they described as the com the computer in their own terms often coining words to indicate what they saw on screen for instance the children's word for the r glass symbol that appears when a program is thinking was dumru the name of a small wooden drum shaped like an r glass that is a symbol of the hindu god shiva the mouse cursor was called sui a hindi word for needle or teer which means arrow right so all i want to tell you is we need to strongly resist not only the vocabulary of yak or the vocabulary of digital humanities that is considered normative in anglo america but we also need to question the affordances of hack right how technology is used in western epistemic context or an anglo american epistemic context the same tools might be used very differently in my country and i am talking of again india specifically i do not have the bandwidth or the uh, uh, desire to speak of south asia as a whole because that would be unfair right so i'm focusing again to tell you to take away the key point that hack or yak might not look the same way so stop we can come to hack or yak from a very global south perspective and global south and global north i often think that people think these are geographical locations they are not they are relational terms right so you can be a native american reservation in the bang in the middle of new mexico which is in the us but you can still be in the global south because it depends as a relational term it talks about power differentials okay right so this is a slide that i developed and this is a I developed for the ADHO uh, presentation, and I'm going to sort of talk about it again. It's a pretty recent slide. So, if I'm looking at rhizomatic DH in India, 
and this is my last slide so we'll go into questions after this and i think we are making good time in on my watch it's 559 so we're just about making good time so for example if dh is considered rhizomatic in india it exists in the social imaginary of the humanities in post colonial spaces now we have to remember two things one firstly if you check the ai sag which is the all india survey for higher education 40% of students go into the humanities in india 40% 40 and if you know the population of india the number of students who every year go into go into uh, you know college education 40% is not a small number so it's time that we started talking of humanities in much more um, you know much more you know must be much more aggressive aggressive as i mean that we need to talk about humanities much more and the social imaginary of the humanities in post colonial spaces is also problematic it's checkered because humanities in this country was not developed to create research infrastructures if you remember macaulay's merit on education english was given to us because we were told that uh, one library of european books is better than the entire library of india the entire number of books in india so education especially humanities education had a very colonial signified where they were supposed to create babus to service colonial overlords right so humanities education in india is not in the model of liberal arts education which was the humboldian model where there was the quadrum and the trivium right mathematics music astronomy art logic grammar rhetoric so liberal arts is not just about the humanities also so that social imaginary also has to be questioned and that is what has been happening in the our country for the last 60 70 years the last 70 years many of most of our colleagues in the humanities have been actively contesting post colonial studies for example is an active site of contestation of these epistemes that colonial legacies have left us right so now what is all of this social imaginary based in it's based in educational institutions it's based in governmental institutional funding it's based in intersectional privileges for example a uh, upper class upper caste man teaching at a premier institution in this country probably doesn't go through not probably surely doesn't go through half of the challenges or one fourth of the challenges that um a person teaching at a far more an underprivileged institution in this country does so those are very important considerations then we have to think about technological affordances right simple i have been teaching online and you know speeds internet bandwidths have become a big issue so yesterday i was at a class where my i had a bandwidth problem and i couldn't share screen so these there are technological affordances does that mean we will not do dh work no because on the other hand we must actively question epistemes who say oh only such tools or such bandwidths can do dh work no we can do dh work and you have to consider our affordances another place that dh is based in but is not talked about enough is the glam sector and i am particularly uh, uh, you know sort of very happy that our collective and alliance has managed to attract or managed to collaborate with a lot of not yet collaborations in the term of full fledged projects but definitely the terms of conversation the glam is galleries libraries archives museum sector which are a fundamentally important part of dh right so that sector has to be and we need to engage them much more for example uh, professor banerji shomibendra's work is in theater and i feel theater is a wonderful space uh, to talk about what kind of archives for theater exist in this country professor arjun also um, arjun also works in theater work and theater studies and performance studies so those are very important questions for example one of my dh works currently is about creating an archive of vishnoi literature right so i worked during my phd project on uh, vishnoi literature and how that creates a uh, minority ecology of texts against nuclearization and i want to create an archive of vishnoi texts which do, which actually challenge canonical anglo american eco criticism but unless that archive exists we can't we can't talk about that right but also when we talk about archives there's my colleague maya from my professor maya dot from flame who works on uh, the politics of archiving and venkat uh, srinivasan who's at ncps who's working on archives so all of this ecology what is what does it do it's a praxis for what for catalyzing a humanistic anti hierarchical non exclusionary and collaborative signified for the decolonized digital humanities and this is fundamentally important because this is based in a global economic environment which is capitalistic and in a neoliberal world order where collaborative signifies are rarely seen neoliberalism believes in individual signifies so we must try and create a praxis 
for catalyzing humanistic, anti-hierarchical, and collaborative signifies for a decolonized digital humanities. That is what where I will end for today, and I'll stop sharing screen and I'll take questions. Okay, um, I can see some questions. Professor Banerjee, would you like me to take them uh, from the box? Is that something you'd like me to do? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Dibbo. Uh, you can start taking questions uh, from the box. Usually we read them out, but if it's fine for you, you can... Uh, no, that's fine for me. Uh, there's, no labor in, there's no labor involved in reading questions from a box. Is it correct to call the people who are doing digital humanities as digital humanists? It's far more difficult to identify who is who is, who is or not a humanist. Uh, Devupriya, if I can call you by your first name. Um, I, I, if you're here, would you like to qualify that question? Uh, he is Devupriya Pal from oh, Devupriya. Calcutta University. Okay. Uh, yeah, he was our colleague here. Uh, okay. Is Devupriya uh, here still? Okay, Devupriya is uh, so, what I'd like you to uh, clarify that uh, the word humanist it comes with a lot of cultural uh, significance, There's a long history appended towards it, of course, uh, uh, a kind of a Western cultural baggage that we normally associate with this term. So, and in uh, the even in the post-colonial context, uh, to be a humanist in today's uh, uh, so very uh, politically charged world uh, will not be a very easy thing. So doing digital humanities and being a humanist, uh, uh, I think uh, we should not confuse between them. And uh, I think uh, uh, for a humanist, uh, the mandate uh, is something different, whether it is... Uh, followed digitally or it is not followed digitally. So this is uh, what I... Okay, uh, so I, I, I understand and I agree with your point about humanities having a long cultural baggage of colonization and Anglo-American epistemes. But I wouldn't agree on the point by saying that the agenda for humanists and digital humanists is different. If humanists create cultures of conversation between knowledge networks, and digital humanists are just creating those cultures of conversation so by acknowledging... Uh, uh, are different. Rather, I said that whether uh, the humanist follows the digital tools or not, after all, the uh, humanism is what is fun fundamentally he or she is supposed to profess. Yes. Professor Paul, as I, as I said up front, absolutely the research question decides whether you are using digital humanists. You can be an occasional digital humanist. You don't need to be a digital humanist all the time. But fundamentally, the whether you choose to engage digital networks of knowledge depends on your research question. So that's my and, uh, short um, answer. In front of research question, I, I find it interesting. Uh, uh, you are absolutely right that the research question should, uh, in a way, uh, dictate or, uh, in a way, chart out the very course for using the digital tools. And I also think that... Uh, uh, there should be a kind of a clear perspective about uh, the outcome of that research so that the human reach of that particular research work should also be taken into consideration before... Absolutely, absolutely. I couldn't agree more with you. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more with you, Dr. Paul, because I think it's... The normal or that, uh, I would say, the traditional ways of uh, doing humanities as far as the higher uh, studies are concerned in India or in elsewhere uh, can perfectly uh, make use of the digital technology. But the Absolutely. ultimate uh, uh, goal should not be uh, rather much changed with the introduction of those digital Absolutely. Technologies. I think, I think, I think you're absolutely correct when you point out that uh, if I might use the corporate word, the deliverables, the deliverables must be humanistic in nature, in the sense they must help or augment existing knowledge structures or, as you say, large swaths of the population. So if I'm creating an archive of Vishnu literature, I just can't decide to do it on my own. I have to take the permission of marginalized, vulnerable subjectivities. If I'm using their archives, I must have conversations with them and I must ask them and must tell them what is going to be the purpose of that archive. So absolutely in agreement with you that they must have a much larger um, a much larger impact than just being an isolated academic project, which as you have rightly pointed out, 
often sometimes in humanities we exist in our smaller silos and the projects never reach out beyond that i completely agree so i'll take the next question if that's okay professor banerji is that okay yes yes please dr um, panda's question yeah uh, dr panda as you've quoted the humanities defines cultures and human experiences how do you see the future role of digital humanities in terms of projecting the shared human experiences and what will the role of digital computation in humans um that's a wonderful question dr panda thank you for asking i think i don't have the answer is the honest answer because part of working with 30 and my colleagues is trying to understand and all we know at this point of time is that there is not one singular teleology of digital humanities in india at this point of time but we hope that these projects are essentially allowed to exist under a larger tent and create what you said shared human experiences and those conversations must be important so uh, my short answer is i don't have an answer and in some senses politically to put it i don't want to have an answer because that would put one signify for the digital humanities which i'm not not going to put and i don't want to because i don't think that exists right but thank you so much it's a lovely question um how does close reading have a colonial legacy dr basu i think i have pointed that out in my talk already so um because print comes with print capitalism as i mentioned benedict anderson uh, in imagine community so i think that question has been addressed uh, sir i am doing my masters in korean language and literature amar dibas how can i design my further studies i mean uh, which skill have to learn to work in this field with foreign language knowledge amar dibas that's great to know congratulations i'm more than happy to have an offline discussion with you on where we could take this forward we also have a slack link which professor banerji will also share with colleagues here uh, the criticism on dh is its inability to address texts under copyright and its preference on research driven projects for pedagogical ones what you say um, mr sharma riyanka you are absolutely correct dh has a focus on research driven projects and as i told you just now that uh, dh pedagogy is very under considered in this overall epistem so it's absolutely correct and uh, that's something that we need to talk about nirmala and i my colleague we just have an essay out in debates in dh pedagogy where we exactly talked about that that the signified for dh in most places is research driven projects pedagogy is hardly considered so this is a very important question riyanka and i would love you to join dharti if you if you have the time and the opportunity and take this question forward so i agree with you um and that's all i have to say right i agree and i think that's something that can be a way of resisting one of the one of, you know one of the anglo american epistemes of ph per se virtual reality okay i'll take the next question uh, sharoni goshal asks um virtual reality is all in the covid situation marriage and divorce are also taking place on google meet i see it as a potential threat as a human touch is missing emoticons explosive and that's just a comment so i uh, i agree with i think the hypothesis but there is not a question there um ha govana asks how do you navigate copyright and using text analysis on boyant or other tools is it necessary to write to publishers before you start working on a project if the work is not in the public domain if you if you are just paying or not if the work is not in the public domain then uh, you must ask permission absolutely but most of the works that uh, that i do work with on boyant are public domain text in fact under fair use policy Uh, which is the uh, under i think uh, 152 of the say, fair use copyright act in this india 20 20% 20 of any text can be used by academics for academic and educational purposes so up to 20% is fine but beyond that you do have to ask permission and uh, that's uh, also a question that some of my colleagues are working on open access and that needs to be a very important consideration so thank you governor for that question um Professor Mikhail Das, are you seeing increased acceptance of intersectional research among Indian heads of departments? My field of children's literature is notoriously discussed by some male professors and authority. I couldn't agree more, Dr. Mikhail. Right? This is so important and so vital to acknowledge. And I would actually want uh, your views on this because yes, DH right now, for example, in most institutions, data doesn't have any purchase or currency uh, mm-hmm. on your tenure file. doing a dh research project does not give you tenure mm. um it's considered just another research project right mm. so um i i uh, we are all fighting but uh, far far from uh, you know getting some but it's happening the good part is that funding is coming in and with funding there's part there's impress uh, so 
those kings are giving fund, money for funding these projects. So yes, I think those signifiers have to change personal clear for these, right? Thank you so very much. Um, uh, sir, what is the future of DH? I have no answer. I don't know. Um, I hope it's a uh, decolonized future, but I don't want to give you an answer because you are the people who are going to create that future. Right? Uh, Professor Banerjee, that's the end of the questions. If you have anything from me, else yeah. I'm happy to address. So uh, are we done with the questions? Basically, are there any other questions that uh, the participants might be having? Uh, if if we are done with the questions, then we will call it a day. So uh, thank you, Dipodoti, very much for this uh, very illuminating talk. We were really uh, listening uh, with awe uh, about whatever you were saying. Particularly important was how you are looking at this whole process of decolonizing uh, digital humanities. But see, you see, one uh, I would like to give uh, one or two observations or questions also. Uh, one thing what is important was that uh, we are a provincial university we are located at malda in west bengal as you know and uh, yes probably we still look at literature from an orthodox uh, standpoint and uh, of course we are open to change but uh, i think this is this your talk today uh, was primarily addressed to our students who are postgraduate students here uh, many of whom uh, are, weren't really aware that much of uh, DH, which is why I wanted you to talk uh, on this uh, here. And this, I'm sure, would open up uh, certain new vistas, which, again, as I was discussing also with you earlier, mm -hmm. would lead on towards uh, a new praxis, a new uh, mode of decolonizing digital humanities as such. See, one example that I was, I was wondering, uh, whenever it comes to uh, you know looking for some uh, parts or some issues from Bengal's history, for example, uh, when we look that up on the net, we don't find uh, proper information, very limited information, particularly if it's that if it's of uh, you know some archival material from the 19th century or something like that. But uh, in parallel, whenever it is in English or whenever it is. Uh, from the UK or the USA, I mean, loads of material is is coming up visibly. So I think as uh, at least... Can know, I just interject here one? I completely agree with you. Completely agree with you. There are some projects that are coming up from Kolkata. Uh, for example, Pro Shovika, Professor Shovik Mukherjee's project on the uh, Hugli Dutch Cemetery, right? And there's Intact, which is on 30, as you know, they have just shared. Uh, Ramanuj Konar, who's working on uh, Hugli's... Uh, Chandunagur's legacy, which is being archived. But you made a very important point, which I probably didn't make in my presentation, which is that it's not only important, you know, what is being archived, but who gets the choice to archive, right? Part of what is being archived is often ruled by the people who are deciding on it. So if British, and pardon my saying so, when British Library takes our archives and archives them, and then we have to pay money to go and access those archives. That's an act of epistemic violence, right? So our hope is that, as you rightly pointed out, um, that you rightly pointed out that we must then talk about a new praxis, which will hopefully come from our students. From and there cannot be a disregard for any form of regional, provincial forms of DH, which is, as you know, Shomi Pandura, that's one of my major major sort of activist uh, speeds, right? So, yeah, absolutely. And I just wanted to, sorry for inter interrupting. Just wanted to agree with big, big yes, time on that. Of course, yeah. I mean, that is what basically I was trying to say. Thank you very much. Uh, the other thing is that the Maya Dodd, I was, the other day I was looking at Maya Dodd's works, particularly the brilliant work that her students are doing in, in building up archives. And you see, I, I was amazed by one of, one of her students who, who has made this repository of cookbooks Community cookbooks, yeah. Yeah, community cookbooks. Yeah, it was such a brilliant idea. So uh, one uh, little thing for my students uh, from your site, uh, say uh, they are in their final year of post-graduation and soon they would move out towards research and work as well. So, I mean, would you suggest uh, some of them move towards uh, PhD in uh, DH or uh, at your institute maybe? And, and how uh, I, can they also... Okay, right. That's a good question. Part as well. I, uh, that, thank you, Sean Pendola. That is an important question because my institute doesn't have a PhD in DH as of yet. The first institute to have a PhD in DH in this country is IIT Jodhpur. 
if you are uh, if you are interested please go to the iit jodhpur website professor yeah, morakshi choudhury morakshi is there yes professor morakshi choudhury professor chiranjay chattopadhyay they have they have the first phd in digital humanities and an msc in digital humanities that's being uh, and that's a phenomenal i had a small part in uh, creating the curriculum last year for that project i was invited to iit jodhpur it's a brilliant curriculum and it's really interdisciplinary there's computer scientists talking on a uh, equal level with humanists and as professor mcleod pointed out right there is you know there is no differentiating between even in literature and literary science departments we differentiate or oh, children's literature is not that important 20th century uh, modernist uh, 19th century modernist literature and 20th century modernist literature is far more important right those distinctions have fallen away right so uh, yes i think if they want to explore i'm happy to do our offline chats and about the pedagogy question uh, my next talk that is happening on the 9th of august for another platform i'm more happy to share that with you is actually going to be about how i teach and the projects that my students have created so we are trying to create an archive of student projects which is very important because i think i someone mentioned here uh, what about dh pedagogy and yes my students have been doing fantastic work at flip so and that must be must be talked about yeah Uh, right okay uh, there's another question actually who is uh, insisting that you take uh, that question okay, so uh, dh uh, will replace uh, formal education in future i mean physical so i think gona uh, you are um, um, sort of mistaking digital humanities for a platform digital humanities is not a platform as i said it's an array of convergent practices digitality might be the learning environment has nothing to do with digital humanities only learning environment when you consider but i don't think uh, dh is here to replace anything right dh is only here to create new models of knowledge so that's my response so yeah so anyway uh, when is when is this next talk that is coming up 9th of august 9th of august i'll share the details with you yeah okay thank you uh, professor uh, roy for uh, being with us today uh, we have been really uh, happy to host you uh, on behalf of the department of english university of golbongo i thank you warmly and uh, we hope that we carry on uh, uh, to retain uh, this connection uh, in, in future Absolutely. with some thank you so much thank you for inviting me it's a pleasure and i'm yes. happy that almost 73 people stayed on to listen to my rant to the end so appreciate that and thank you so much you appreciate and have a good good evening everyone bye bye for now. okay okay bye 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 people thank you